P. David Pearson has made numerous substantive contributions to literacy education, and for these contributions, he has been recognized with awards from all prominent literacy organizations. Membership in the National Academy of Education and from the University of Minnesota, where he received his PhD, their highest award, the Alumni Outstanding Achievement Award. He is unarguably the premier scholar nationally and internationally on comprehension, instruction, and assessment. He has been actively involved in literacy standard setting since such efforts were initiated in the late 1980s and most recently was a member of the Select Validation Committee for the Common Core State Standards. In that comprehension critique inquiry of text is the end goal of what we do in literacy instruction, David's perspectives on this topic are fundamental to forging interpretations and implementations of the Common Core. I am honored that David agreed to provide this inaugural presentation in the Text Project Presents series. And now, P. David Pearson speaking on research and the Common Core. Can the romance survive? Well, hi, everybody. Uh, do I have control over this now? I think you don't yet, so I'm working on it. And let's see if I can get this a little bit. Let's see here. Uh, yep, I've been. Are you, have I given you control? Yeah, you have. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Pearson. I want to thank you, Freddie, for um, uh, inviting me to be the inaugural presenter in this important uh, series on the Common Core Standards. Uh, I, I'm honored that uh, uh, you selected me, and, I, and I'm thrilled that uh, so many people have decided to join us today. My goals for today are straightforward. I want to remind us quickly of what the Common Core Standards for English Language Arts are designed to do. And I want to examine their potential, uh, the new possibilities that, that they bring to allow us to take the high road on curriculum, text, and cognitive challenge. But I also want to explore their dark side, if you will, the potholes, sinkholes, and black holes that uh, challenge us, in it, particularly in their implementation. And then I want to end with some defensible positions to take on curriculum and pedagogy as we move into the all-important implementation phase. And by the way, um, the uh, slides will be posted uh, uh, on the Text Project website, and um, uh, I think uh, you know as soon as this uh, presentation is over. I do want to uh, be clear about my relationship with the Common Core State Standards. As Freddie said, I was a member of the Validation Committee. I also uh, did a, a fair amount of background work on text complexity with the grant uh, from the Gates Foundation to sort of figure out how it worked at different levels uh, of um, uh, uh, different grade levels and the like. And I have a long and often checkered history with standards going back to the National Board, to the IRA, NCTE standards, uh, and many state standards efforts in the various states I've worked in. And I've done a lot of research and development work on assessment, especially the sorts of assessments that I think are likely to be privileged uh, by uh, the Common Core for English Language Arts as the two consortia, PARC and Smarter Balance, uh, uh, you know, sort of present us with their work. Well, what sold me on the standards? Two things, really. The first thing that sold me is what they said about reading. And to get through this rapidly, I've tried to sort of uh, highlight in purple uh, the, the, um, uh, the ideas that I think I really took to heart when I read this document for the first time. Critical reading, wide, deep, and thoughtful engagement, building knowledge, enlarging experience, broadening world views, cogent reasoning, and the use of evidence that's essential to hybrid deliberation and responsible citizenship. Well, when I first saw these, my response was, what's not to like? And the answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. Everything I believe about literacy learning, why we do it, and uh, why we uh, uh, go into the teaching profession is captured in that uh, very eloquent statement. The second thing that I liked was what they said about teacher choice, particularly coming off the era of No Child Left Behind. And notice here I've tried to highlight some key phrases here, too. Thus, the standards do not mandate such things as a particular writing process or the full range of metacognitive strategies. Teachers are thus free to provide students with whatever tools and knowledge their professional judgment and experience identify as most helpful. Uh, that's a real sea change in terms of 
the, the kind of role that teacher uh, prerogative plays in, in, the, in this particular standards movement, and as I said, especially in relationship uh, to the era of No Child Left Behind. And I think it represents just the right balance uh, between uh, the body politic and the profession. Uh, let the body politic uh, at every level have a voice in the big overarching goals of education, and at every level along the way, from the state to the district to the school to the classroom, leave a little room for each player to place his or her signature on the effort. And when it comes to making judgments about what's best uh, for uh, individual kids and groups of kids in classrooms, let's make sure that teachers have some research and professional development of informed prerogative there too. Why? Because we know that identity buy-in uh, and signature uh, are all important to uh, uh, teachers' capacity to implement the standards. And it seems to me that this is the right kind of political negotiation amongst levels within the system. And for that reason, I was very keen on the standards. So in 2010, I signed on the dotted line to say that these standards are worthy of our professional support and implementation. And I was ready to go on the road and seek converts. But as I found in, with so many journeys we've taken in, in life, the road to paradise has been a little rocky. And today what I want to do is to share with you uh, some of the, the rocky roads uh, that I found as we moved uh, closer to implementation. Uh, there are, I've identified in an article, the title of which I'll share with you in a moment, five research assumptions about the Common Core uh, that I think uh, you know the Common Core rests on. And I want to examine two in particular that most pertain to uh, what I take to be uh, the, the central uh, purpose of the standards, and that is to promote comprehension, critique, and reasoning. For each of these assumptions, uh, I want to answer two questions. Is there research available to justify the claims implicit in the standards? And secondly, is there reason to believe that the implementation of the standards will be guided by this research You know, once they get out into states and, and districts and schools. Here are the five research assumptions that I uh, deal with in this article, uh, the title of which I'm going to share in a moment. Uh, we know how reading develops. Uh, literacy is best developed by acquiring disciplinary expertise. Uh, as I implied earlier in talking about teacher prerog pr prerogative standards set the goals, teachers and schools control the means. Uh, fourth assumption is that students read better and learn more when they have adequate challenge in text. And finally, comprehension involves building models of what a text says, what it means, and how it can be used. Today, I really have time only to emphasize two of these assumptions, so I'm going to focus on those that I think are most central uh, to meaning making. Uh, that's uh, number five, uh, what comprehension consists of, and number two, uh, what we know about how reading develops across levels of expertise. The other assumptions are discussed uh, in uh, the paper that I've listed here on, on uh, this particular slide, uh, and it's going to come out, uh, you know, very soon, within the next month, I think, in a book uh, that IRA is publishing, edited by Susan Newman and Linda Gambrell. And the whole book is about the Common Core, and there's lots of great articles in it. You can uh, see a pre-publication PDF, and you can also see these slides at the website where I publish most of my professional work. And there's a link to these on the on the text project website too, so you don't really have to write that down. Although I am going to show that link in a couple of more slides in case you really do want to write it down. Assumption number one: comprehension involves building models of what a text says, what it means, and how it can be used. And by how it can be used, I I really mean to entail the application of, of the information you you uh, acquire from reading. Uh, to uh, things that happen out in the world, okay? Well, the prevailing research-based wisdom about comprehension, uh, I think, is nicely encapsulated in two documents that have been important in my thinking, and one is Walter Kinch's construction integration model, uh, which is fully articulated in his 1998 book, and also the RAND report on comprehension uh, that was uh, published in 2002, which I think is a nice uh, sort of publicly accessible um, rendition of what we know about comprehension and what also what we still need to learn about it. Just to remind us about the RAND model, the RAND model suggests 
uh, that comprehension occurs at the center of this, uh, uh, you know, a set of concentric circle, where reader, text, and activity interact uh, to uh, produce comprehension, and that all of this activity is set within a social cultural context, which constrains both um, the nature of the activity and the purpose for which you're doing the reading. Okay. And that's sort of like a prevailing model that I think is pretty widely accepted in the field. Kinch's construction and integration model is, is interesting because Kinch contends that there are two key moves. One is construction and the other is integration. Uh, that as you read for every unit, let's say every proposition corresponding to a clause, you construct a text base for it. You sort of figure out what it says. And then you integrate the text and knowledge uh, that you bring from uh, your store of memory to create a situation model. And this is sort of what the text means. So the first thing is what the text says. And then once you've integrated in knowledge, it, with your knowledge base, you have a sense of what it means. You then incorporate the information from that situation model back into your knowledge base. It just doesn't sit there. It actually uh, sort of mixes it up with the knowledge that you have stored in memory. And then, if you're lucky, you can actually use your knowledge to go out and nudge the world a bit, uh, think about how you can use the information, what the information means in terms of uh, what writers are trying to do to get us to understand or to persuade us to do things differently in life. And then you start all over again with the next bit of reading. And so it goes. Construction, integration, construction, integration, and on and on. And that's Kinch's model of, of, uh, of uh, comprehension. Uh, my claim in 2000 was that the vision of comprehension in the co in the Common Core Standards maps pretty well onto um, important theoretical assessment and curricular research. And you know the ones that were most important to me were the models of comprehension underlying the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which I'm a really a big fan of. I'm also a big fan of the Four Resources model that. Peter Freebody and Alan Wink introduced to us in the late 80s, early 90s. And then, of course, I'm you know, uh, quite committed to Kinch's construction integration model. Now, just to review briefly, here are the 10 common core standards. I know that you've seen these uh, uh, more often than you like. And what I've got here is the anchor or the college and crew ready version of the, of the standards. And this is what you're supposed to be able to do when you leave high school. And I actually prefer dealing with these uh, rather than the grade by grade standards because I think they send a, a, a much more concise m message about what uh, uh, what's entailed in in in, uh, in promoting comprehension. And I want to point out that they fall roughly into three categories: key ideas and details, which sort of get at unpacking the text and how how relationships amongst ideas work in the text and you know, they really focus on, if you will, to use the terminology I introduced in the last slide, what the text says. Uh, if you go down here to the bottom one, integration of knowledge and ideas, this is where you integrate, compare, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, evaluate uh, uh, arguments and the like. And this is this is the stuff of what the text means. Okay, and then in the middle part, in craft and structure you get to things like point of view and purpose, how that uh, shapes the text, and you analyze the structure. This is where you're trying to figure out what authors are, are trying to do and to analyze the tools that they're using to accomplish those goals. So that roughly corresponds to, if you will, uh, what the text does. Okay? So again, the Common Core fall into those three big categories, right? Then here's NAEP. Uh, NAEP has three cognitive targets. One's locate and recall, uh, and that's basically, you know, searching a text and finding information, uh, and corresponds roughly to what we commonly call literal comprehension. Uh, interpret and integrate. Uh, uh, this is the stuff of building models of meaning, a la Kinch, and this is, uh, 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 you know, a lot of inference uh, and it, it is involved in this, and this is roughly corresponding to what the text means. And then finally, critique and evaluate where students are asked, uh, you know, uh, what authors are really trying to, to do and, uh, 
and they, they are asked to critique the, uh, the quality and the validity and the power of messages that authors, uh, you know, uh, try to create, okay? So I looked at the Common Core, the three big categories, and I looked at NAEP, and I asked myself, how well, is the, how well does the mapping work for one to another? And, you know, it's, this is a kind of a gloss, I admit it, but in general, key ideas and details in the Common Core corresponds roughly to locating the call and make. Uh, the craft and structure of business in the Common Core, uh, if it maps on anything, it maps more closely on to critique and evaluate. And the integration of knowledge and ideas maps onto uh, the integrate and interpret from NAEP with a little nod that there's a few things over here in the integration of knowledge and ideas that are more like critique and evaluate, particularly standard needs. Okay? So the mapping's not perfect, but it's close. Then I looked at uh, uh, Luke and uh, Free Bodies for Resources model, and if you recall, they have um, uh, the reader as decoder, which is really getting the words off the page and getting a kind of a, a veridical message. Uh, then they have the reader as meaning maker, where you integrate uh, what you get off the page with knowledge uh, and uh, figure out what the text means. And then, then there's two categories, one that, that are more on the critical edge. One is the reader as text analyst, where you're sort of trying to figure out how it is that authors are uh, accomplishing uh, the goals that they're trying to achieve. And then there's the reader as text critic, where you're trying to figure out what the subtext is, what's the hidden or not so hidden agenda. This is where we analyze uh, what writers are trying to get us, if you will, to do. So this, again, roughly corresponds to what the text says, what the text means, and with apologies to Luke and Freebody and glossing over the distinctions between the analyst and the critic, what the text does. So, I, I said to myself, there's room here for a grand synthesis. So we have what the text says, means, and does. We have locate and recall, in, integrate and interpret. We have uh, the decoder, the meaning maker, uh, the a user analyst critic, and these correspond to the common course terminology for key ideas and details, integration of knowledge and ideas, and craft and structure. And I said to myself, uh, we've got a grand synthesis. By the way, if you don't like the layer view and you like to see everything at once, here's those same uh, terms spread out in a chart. But to me, I said to myself, this is, this is really key. Uh, and it, it, for me, what this meant for the standards is that they have credibility in the sense that they can relate to things that uh, uh, that we have uh, really pushed hard in, in, in the field of reading uh, in terms of other other efforts like NAEP and uh, uh, the um, the construction integration model and uh, you know the, the four resources it also means that they have stretch they can uh, you know, stretch out to other efforts and connect with those and it gives the whole thing a kind of a research patina uh, that I think uh, would uh, make them uh, uh, highly credible within uh, the literacy field. So when all this happened in, this, in 2010, when I did this analysis, I was ready to go on the road and sell these standards to anyone who would listen. I really was. I was very enthusiastic. I thought we were on uh, the verge of a sea change in how we thought about reading uh, curriculum and pedagogy, and uh, I was all for it. And now for something completely different. Um, and this happened to me about a year and a half ago when I first encountered uh, what is arguably the first attempt at uh, guiding implementation of the standards. And this is a document called the, the initially it was called the Publishers Criteria, and now the Revised Publishers Criteria for the Common Core State Standards. And this was a book, a little pamphlet that David Coleman and Sue uh, Pimentel, who, by the way, were also the lead authors on the Common Core Standards, uh, 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 this is what they published as a sort of a first attempt to give advice to publishers about how they should think about implementing the standards in, in, in their book. Uh, I mean, you know, as, as they created new materials and the like. So one would expect a high degree of concurrence between what was in the standards and what was in uh, the, um, uh, this uh, publisher's criteria. Well, yes and no. Um, the first thing that struck me as I read this was how strong the message was on stay with the text, stay with the text, avoid 
you know, uh, sort of intrusions into prior knowledge. Uh, don't get caught up in uh, trying to march out kids' prior knowledge so that they can connect, con con connect it to the text and the like. And I've tried to highlight just some key phrases in, in several of the, of the passages from the published criteria. Uh, a significant percentage of the tasks and questions are text dependent. What do text dependent questions do? They follow the details of what is explicitly stated. Now they do admit that you can also make valid claims that square with the evidence in the text. So that allows for inference. But then look at the next, the very next uh, uh, statement. Text dependent questions do not require information or evidence from outside the text or text. They establish what follows and what does not follow from the text itself. That looks to me a lot like stay with the text. My big fear, you know, and here's another one, staying close to the text. Materials make text the focus of instruction. Avoid features that distract from text. Uh, uh, materials should highlight the reading se uh, selections. Publishers should be extremely sparing in offering activities that are not text-based. Well, what's my worry here? I mean, I'm all for close reading. I, I actually like close reading. But my worry here is that this kind of advice, uh, when, you know, when taken to heart by publishers, will drive them into operationalizing text dependent as literal factual questions. And what they will do is that they will forget that lots of other questions and tasks are also text reliant. Here are three questions that you might ask on a passage about uh, you know westward expansion. What are two reasons the pioneers moved west? What does the author believe about the causes of westward expansion in the United States? And how valid is the claim that the author writes from an ideology of manifest destiny? Well, what's interesting about these three questions to me is that I would argue that in answering this, you could go to the past and you, and you could find two reasons why the pioneers moved west. You could go read that passage and you could, you, you could use the same um, textual information to answer this question about interpretation about what the author's beliefs are. And you, could, you might also use that same information as evidence uh, to support a claim or to, uh, about whether the author writes from that uh, ideology of uh, manifest destiny. You, my point is, is that you don't need a literal factual question to promote close reading of text. Uh, and, and so I would hate to see uh, all uh, you know, interrogations of the text reduced to literal comprehension simply because we want kids to do close reading. But more importantly, I think that one of uh, the things that these uh, statements reveal is a, funda a fundamental misunderstanding about reading theory and particularly about the role that knowledge plays in comprehension. And the, fundam the fundamental misunderstanding is that you can actually understand text without engaging prior knowledge. And my assertion, and I think it's very well uh, borne out with uh, all the research and all the important theories on reading comprehension is that every action, whether it's critical, inferential, or literal, requires the use of prior knowledge to carry it out. You can't even read and understand a simple, a single sentence without invoking your prior knowledge. So I wonder why Coleman and Pimentel were so down on prior knowledge. What was it that they were seeing out there that led them to believe that we needed a huge correction in, in how we engaged in reading practice? Well, before I answer that question, let me uh, uh, show you one other, uh, uh, one or two other quotes. The common core standards call for students to demonstrate a careful understanding of what they read before engaging their opinions, appraisals, or interpretations. So we're going to let uh, uh, folks do uh, interpretation, but not until what? They have demonstrated that they follow the details of the, and logic of an author's argument uh, before they're asked to evaluate or compare. Well, what's my problem with that? That seems like a good thing to do. We will view literal comprehension as a prerequisite to inferential or critical comprehension. Compare these two tasks. I could have you read text, one text, then I could have you read another text, and then I could have you compare them, for example, on the role that the protagonist plays in driving the action of the narrative. 
Or I could just say, you know, an interesting thing about narratives is who's driving the action. And what I want you to do is uh, we're going to read two texts, and when you read those two texts, I want you to think about this question. Is the protagonist or is some other character or some other element of the story driving the action, okay? And that's what I want you to compare them with. And my point is that, is that sometimes a comparison or a critique question better rationalizes the close reading. If I just tell you to read text X, and then I tell you to read text Y, I haven't really given you a purpose for it. And so sometimes knowing that the ultimate purpose and goal of the examination is a comparison or a critique might actually invoke a, a strategy of closer reading. Uh, regarding close reading, the common, uh, this, it also says this in the publisher's criteria. Uh, the common core standards place a high priority on the close, sustained reading of complex texts, beginning with reading standard one. Such reading emphasizes the particular over the general and strives to focus on what lies within the four corners of the text. I love, and I know David Coleman loves the metaphor of the four corners of the text. But, you know, it does bring up a kind of a con conundrum. You know, I think a lot of things lie within the four corners of the text. Some of them are general and some are specific. Writers use both general ideas and specific ideas all the time. And by the way, something I can never figure out is how long is something in the text? Is an idea in the text while you're reading that page? Is it, you know, the, the two-page folio that you're reading that it's in the text? Is it in the text as long as you're reading the chapter? How about the whole book? Or is there a point, say, when you're on page 10, at which you can't tell the difference between what you knew before you set eyes on the text and what you learned as you were reading page 3 of the text? One of the things that I like to say about reading is that the prior knowledge at any given point is greater than the prior knowledge you had at a previous point because it's been informed by the information that you've acquired between that first point and that second point. Another point I want to make about knowledge is that the text drags prior knowledge along even if you don't want it to. One of the basic tenets of schema theory is that words instantiate schemata. And what that means is that they invoke them. If you read the phrase, business have been slow since the oil crisis, it's almost impossible for you as a reader not to think about what kind of business and not to think about you know, the, the kinds of uh, effects oil crises can have on commerce. Texts cry out for a schema to attach uh, themselves to. And ideas that don't connect don't last long enough to allow, allow learning where that means assimilating information into pre-existing schema or accommodating your schema to the new information. If the ideas don't last long enough, uh, learning won't occur. They'll, those ideas will drop out of memory pretty fast. They'll literally go in one eye and out the other. Yeah, here's another role for knowledge, and that's monitoring. How do we know that our understanding is good enough at any point along the way? Well, you know, we use two standards, really, uh, and this is uh, part and parcel of um, Kinch's model. We ask, does it square with the text base I have built thus far in today's reading? And the text base is the last clause, the last sentence, the last paragraph, the last page, and even more uh, until, you know, you can't tell the difference between what was in the text and your knowledge. And then also, does it square with what I know to be true on the, about the world in terms of the knowledge that I bring to the task? And those are really the two criteria, and that's why the text space and the situation model uh, aspects of the CI uh, model are so important. So what about prior knowledge? Why has it taken such a beating in the publisher's criteria? One thought is that uh, that Sue and, and David, like I, have seen too much indulgence at the trough of prior knowledge, uh, too much no, not enough want to learn or learn, uh, to use the metaphor of KWL, uh, too much picture walk with no time left to do the reading, uh, too much story swapping about our experiences with roadrunners before we get to the text and we realize we've been swapping stories for 40 minutes and only have two minutes left to read the text. Well, that's a problem, and I think it should be corrected, but let's write those wrong. So I think we need a, a mid-course correction, not a pendulum swing to make this correct, to make this work. We need to think of knowledge in proper perspective or a balanced view of knowledge where it doesn't run amok with things or knowledge in the service of understanding. But let me tell you, if we, if we think that we can teach comprehension without 
considering, invoking, and understanding the knowledge and experience that kids bring to the table, I think we're in for a rude awakening. Asking kids to hold their prior knowledge at bay is like asking dogs not to bark or leaves not to fall. It's in the nature of things. Dogs bark, leaves fall, and readers use their knowledge to render text sensible and to figure out what to retain for later on. It's just the way it works. So what's a body to do? Uh, first of all, I think we can embrace the construct of close reading, but make sure that it applies to several purposes for reading. Reading to get the flow of ideas, surely. Reading to enhance our knowledge base. Uh, reading to compare uh, with another text or body of experience or knowledge. Reading to critique. Uh, all of these approaches interrogate the text as an evidentiary base, and I think that's what it has in, 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 in the, that's what all, they all have in common. I want us to embrace the virtuous cycle where knowledge begets text comprehension, begets knowledge, so we know more and can therefore understand even more text that we read. Now the more comprehensive view of close reading that I've just put forward is actually more consistent with the historical precedence of close reading that we find in the new criticism from the 1920s through the 1960s. Here's some more things you can do. Stay closer to the standards than to the interpretations of the standards we've seen thus far. Enact a full model of close reading, as I've already suggested. I like the force resources model, but anything that encompasses literal, interpretive, and critical tasks will do. Pay more attention to the anchor standards, uh, the college and crew ready standards, than to the grade level instantiations of them. Why? I'm not convinced that they got the sequencing right. That's the next assumption I'm going to examine. And I think what matters most is that kids are tra traversing the full range of cognitive moves and challenge that are involved in text understanding, and that would be moving across all nine of those standards. Well, let's talk about assumption number two in the time we have left. How do we know that reading, the assumption is that we know how reading develops across levels of expertise. Here's a, a table I made from the standards. What I've got here is standard three, how elements develop and interact over uh, through the course of a text for both literary and informational text. And I want you to take a quick uh, look at them. And what I want you to do when you look at them is what's the logic that moves us from one grade to the next and the next and the next. So just take a quick perusal of them. Uh, pick one or the other because I'm not going to give you time to look at both, okay? Now, I did a close analysis of these. And I'm going to show you what the results of that analysis were, and then we're going to go back and map on the categories of change as we move from one grade to the next that I found onto this document we're looking at now. Okay? Uh, I found that often what changes is the level of support. That is, when we move from K to one for both literary and informational texts, we remove the scaffolding. Uh, you can you can change the number of entities involved in the process. As you move from uh, L3 to L4, uh, in L3 you just have to do characters, uh, and in, in, um, uh, in, in L4 you have to do character settings and, and events. You can change the type of entities you look at when you move from uh, uh, I, I2 to I, I1 to I2. There's a change from general to discipline-specific discipline entities. I'll show you that in a moment. And when you move from I4 to I5, you change explaining entities to explaining relationships and interactions, okay? Sometimes you increase the cognitive demand. You move from de description to explanation when you move from L2 to L3, and you, you move from explanation to comparison in L4 to L5. And sometimes you have evidentiary requirements that you have to provide evidence to support your answer. So what I've tried to do is to map that this works here now. So let me just show you where these are. Here are the reductions in scaffolds when you go from K to 1. Okay. And then here is where you change the number of things that you look at. So in 3 you're looking at uh, um, characters and in 4 you're looking at character settings or events. Okay. Here is changing the type of thing you look at. Uh, 
and let's see if I can see that. That's what that's on informational one to two and four to five. You can see that you um yeah you're explaining uh, uh, elements and you're and you're explaining relationships when you go to level five. Here is increasing the uh, the cognitive demand of the tax uh, of the task. Uh, often that's uh, you know ex explaining events versus explaining relationships. And I can't remember what the change is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, describing characters or describing how they respond to major events and challenges, and going from literary one to two and the like. And then uh, here's where you get the requirement to add evidence to your explanation. So uh, I thought that was really interesting. I also just to prove that it didn't that it worked at other levels. Here's um, standard four, um, which is about word meanings, uh, and it's grades six, seven, and eight in literature. And I want you to notice that what what's interesting about this is some things stay the same. Determining the meanings of words and phrases as they are used in a text, including figurative and connotative meaning, is exactly the same as you go from six to seven to eight. But what changes? In six, you got you analyze the impact of word choice. And in seven, you an analyze the impact of rhymes and repetitions. And in eight, you 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 uh, analyze uh, the impact of analogies and allusions to other texts and, and, and the like. And so, the question I have is: Well, why did word choice go here, and why did rhymes and repetitions go here, and why did analogies or allusions go here? And when you get to grade eight, do you stop doing rhymes and repetitions, uh, or do you stop doing the general word choice thing? Those are the kinds of things that I can't figure out uh, with the uh, progression of skills in these standards. What's the basis of these progressions? Is it research? Is it tradition? You know, are, are, are there is there research that to show us that this is really the way it, it, it happens? Are these you know the extension of tradition from the scope and sequence charts that we've had in Basel's for so long, or does it represent some kind of professional consensus process where you got a group of uh, educators, uh, a combination of teachers and uh, researchers, for example, and you said, "Okay, we need a progression to go from uh, across the grade levels. Uh, let's uh, figure out what makes sense." Or are they just sometimes best guesses that people make uh, when when they when they've got to have a very uh, 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 specific grain size for their standards as they move uh, from one level to the next? Uh, I'm not sure, and being not sure. I actually asked the standards writers. I actually wrote to uh, Sue Pimentel and, and David Coleman and to um, Phil Darrow, who did the, the math standards, and I asked them, "What did you do?" And you know what they did? They did they did all those things. So if they had evidence, they used it. So if they knew, for example, that there was a research study saying that kindergartners or first graders could actually do summaries, then they had kindergartners and, and first graders do summaries. Uh, they often uh, referred to models of exemplary standards. Other states, states that had a reputation for really good standards or for doing well on, on NAEP. And they also looked at the standards of high achieving countries like Finland and Korea. And this then was a, a, an important source of evidence. And finally, there was professional consensus amongst writers and reviewers. And that's all, you know, I, 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 I think that that's uh, all well and good. And, you know, there does come a point where we have to figure out what we're going to do. But what I don't want to have happen is for people to believe that these uh, uh, these progressions were sort of handed down on stone tablets or, or based upon research or the like. They're they're professional uh, they're professional consensus documents uh, uh, that we have to uh, you know live with uh, when we um, when we try to figure out what to do from one grade level to the next. What are the implications of this approach? The degree to which the research is reflected in these progressions is a function of whether the models they examined were research-based and whether the mental models of the authors and reviewers were research-based. Uh, and sometimes they probably were and sometimes they might not have been. This is a classic consensus process. And by the way, it doesn't distinguish it from most other um, standards efforts, uh, the national board, state standards, even the NAEP achievement levels are, are um, determined by having groups of professionals get together and figure out, you know, what percentage of kids getting an item correct would constitute 
uh, you know, uh, scoring at the uh, uh, proficient or at the uh, advanced level and the like. So what does distinguish the Common Core uh, from these other e e efforts is I think the grain size and the grade level specificity of these standards where we have very particular things uh, working at one grade level and not another grade level. Okay? So what do we do about this sequencing problem? The first thing I think we do is we watch very carefully and we, we ask ourselves important questions. Is the fourth grade version harder than the third grade version? Or are there some discontinuities there? Another question we have to ask is, are the width of the steps between grade levels about the same size? Or when you go from third to fourth, is there a real big sea change? Whereas when you go from second to third or fourth to fifth, there isn't much of a change between the standards. And what do we do about, you know, standards that are, uh, particular tasks that are assigned to a particular grade level? Do we postpone that task until it shows up in the standards document? Do we not do rhyme and alliteration before seventh grade? Uh, and do we not do allusions and um, uh, literary allusions and the like before eighth grade? And once we've done them, do we stop doing them? Uh, I just think that uh, the specificity issue in these standards presents all sorts of implementation problems, which you're all going to find out, I think, when you try to implement these over the next couple of years. When you find discontinuities, I want you to send them to the Common Core Standards folks, or send them to me, and I'll make sure that they get there. And I, want, I also think uh, that, that as we implement these standards, that we should concern ourselves with the big picture I think the anchor standards uh, are sensible, and I would be happy uh, if we uh, dwelled more on those than the specific versions of the standards at each grade level, uh, simply because I'm not sure about their efficacy. Well, that's what I have to say today. Let me close by telling you my hope for the standards. Uh, as critical as I've been, I'm hanging in there for the near term, and the reason I am is that I think these standards are still the best game in town. Uh, they're moving in the right direction in terms of reading theory and research and curriculum. Uh, there, there's a new term out on the horizon called deeper learning. You know, we used to have higher learning, but now we have deeper learning. And we're going to get to the same place by going in a different direction, I suppose. I'm hoping they do pro prove to be a living document. I'm hoping that these standards are revised with advances in our knowledge of reading and with research on their consequences once they get put into use. So, can this romance survive? Is it a fleeting infatuation or a long-term commitment? Well, I think whether it turns out to be a long-term commitment depends on two kinds of leadership. First, leadership amongst its founders and the authors of the standards to respond uh, uh, to the feedback that they get from the field when those of us who try to put them in, into operation find uh, the kinds of discontinuities that I expect we will find. And I think also leadership amongst those of us who implement the standards uh, to speak truth to power and to also make and share improvements. If we find a way of implementing these standards which obviates some of the, uh, of the discontinuities or the like, let's share those with one another. If we can do all this, and I think these standards stand a chance of proving uh, a useful and of benefiting uh, our educational system, uh, uh, our, our plight as teachers, and most importantly, uh, the, um, the, the reading uh, practices and uh, performance of our students. I want to thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing your um, most precious gift of all your time with me today. And now I think I get to turn this back over to uh, Freddie uh, for the next one. Is that right, Teddy? It is, and thank you so much, David. Um, those were some excellent points that you made, and I think some very, very important ones. We have had a number of questions that have been um, coming up, and you've been kind enough to leave us some time to answer questions. The first one has to do with um, the legal obligations of states that adopted the standards. Is there any under whose auspices are these publishers' criteria really coming out? <clears throat> well, I, I, they do carry the the, the logo of the uh, of the governors and the chiefs, and so I'm I'm sure that uh, they uh, support them. Uh, I don't know who vetted them. Uh, 
Uh, it certainly wasn't the validation committee that vetted the standards. I do know that. Uh, and I, I don't know that they were vetted, but uh, uh, that's a good question, and, uh, and it's a question that I would uh, certainly be willing uh, to ask uh, of uh, folks like uh, David Coleman and Sue Pimentel. Well, if you'll do that, we, we can actually post uh, some of that information on the web, website with uh, your webinar information. So really, the states then aren't any, under any legal obligation, really, to follow these publishers' criteria, right? No, I, 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 I doubt it, but I think they're under, I, th I think there's the, the uh, force of moral suasion. And, uh, and you know, uh, I mean, I think publishers are, are uh, paying a lot of attention to it. And okay. if publishers pay a lot of attention to them, it won't matter, uh, you know, whether the states endorse them or not, right? Because the set of choices that uh, schools have will be vastly limited. That's a good point. So someone asked, with the sequencing problem, were you referring to the texts or tests or how, how were you? No, I wasn't referring to the text at all. I was referring only to uh, the, um, the language of the, of the uh, standards as they go from one grade level to the next. Uh, so, so what it's really, would you it's really a task sequencing issue. Okay. And when there are oddities in the sequence, what would you recommend to states and districts? Well, a couple of things. Uh, I, I actually hope that the um, people uh, who wrote the standards will um, pay some attention to these potential oddities and discontinuities and, and bring, us, uh, bring out some guidance on, on, on how to deal with these. I think a lot of it depends upon the degree to which the grade by grade standards get reflected in assessments. Now I can tell you this, uh, given the examples that I have seen from this PARC and the Smarter Balanced websites, I, I don't think that the, those two outfits are using the grade by grade versions of the standards to create their assessments. They're, they're, they, it looks to me like they're sort of uh, making them consistent with something a little closer to the um, uh, the anchor standards version of them, but I don't see, you know, the version that you know the the seventh grade version or the eighth grade version has to have literary allusions, and the seventh grade version has to have uh, rhyme and alliteration in it. In you know, in that in in assessing those particular standards. I think that the assessments um, uh, are being built uh, with some broader conception of uh, what it means to uh, understand text. And I know that Smarter Balanced uses, they have these things called claims and they have these things called targets. And they're only loosely coupled to the grade by grade standards. I think that, you know, it could be that states or that districts will bring out you know, um, their version of formative assessments that are linked to the grade level standards, but I think it would be, I, I, I don't know that it needs to go down that specific. Uh, you know, basically what I want, frankly, is I want people to pay attention uh, to uh, all nine of those, uh, uh, the, the kinds of tasks that are implied by the standards. And, uh, you know, and I would argue for a little flexibility in how we how we I implement those. I know that that's not common with standards, but uh, you know, I certainly, I certainly argue that when these standards get implemented, that a little more flexibility would be would be great. Well, this brings um, me to another question that arose. So, you were talking about, in a sense, evolving standards. Is that something that there's some precedent for, and is that even something that can be worked out in the current system with publishers developing materials. Well, good question. Good question. You're right. Once you, you know, if you change the standards, then then all kinds of people who uh, built things based upon the previous set of standards will be angry with you. Uh, but you know, what's the what's the greater loss? That some people are are angry because you changed the standards, or you changed them because you you found a a better and more valid way of of implementing them. And I would point out, at least in the case of mathematics, that if you, that when the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics first brought out its mathematics standards in I think the late 80s, 
they did revise them. Uh, you know, about a, I don't remember how many years later, eight or ten years later, and the like. So uh, there is precedent for that. And I would also point out that um, the Common Core standards uh, represent a change. For, I mean, we it, we had standards before the Common Core, right? We had uh, in English language arts, we had the NCTE IRA standards in the middle 90s. We had state standards uh, in every state of the union by the by the, the time No Child Left Behind was implemented, and now we're going to change again. And 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 there's enough flexibility in the Common Core in terms of states adding on their own uh, their own extra standards. You know, there's a I can't remember. There's a certain percentage of state determined standards that uh, you know. So so flexibility and and uh, accommodation and change uh, uh, aren't impossible. So David, there's a question. Um, actually, I'm going to go back here. I, I don't think that this is a question that can be answered in a minute, but if you could, th this, this came up in, in the um, Q&A, and I'm wondering if you could just give a really um, quick answer to this, although I think it really deserves much more than that. Well, theoretically, in terms of reading theory, uh, this harkens back uh, to a new criticism, and um, uh, the meaning is in the text, and all you have to do is go get it. Uh, whose voice is privileged in, in such scenarios? The, the people who I think uh, who, uh, who believe that a lot of what's gone uh, on in them um, in reading and literature classrooms uh, has been promoting a kind of a cultural relativism and that there there really are sort of canonical interpretations of text and the like. My own view is that uh, you know there's many ways to interpret a text. You can there's personal meaning which is whatever you think it means when you read it. There's social meaning which is whatever you can negotiate with whoever you're talking to the text about. And then there are cultural meanings, and that is the, the kinds of meanings that are privileged within uh, particular communities of practice, including, of course, the official meetings that, uh, that hold sway on when these ideas are tested, you know, even in a, in a portfolio or assessment or the like. And I guess what I want, to want teachers and students to be aware of is that all of these levels of meaning, personal, social, and cultural, and, and official, are out there, and that they they do have um, uh, uh, you know uh, some uh, political consequences if you aren't aware of them. Uh, and what I want is kids who understand that you know they can understand the text uh, the way they want, but that when they're uh, when they're dealing with text as a political reality, that uh, there are consequences uh, to uh, you know um, abiding by your personal meaning. And if you want to abide by that, you know you, you'll um, you know you'll uh, suffer the uh, political consequences of it. I, it. But I'm not saying that it's good to adhere to the official meetings. I'm just pointing out that they exist. Uh, they're a political reality. Well, David, thank you very very much. As you see, there are lots of additional questions, and maybe some of these are ones that um, I understand that the new uh, literacy research panel is looking at possibly having a question and answer project and you chair the literacy research panel so maybe some of the well, questions. Well that would be great. We'd love to get your questions uh, from all those who participated today. So thanks much Freddie. I really appreciate that. So I want to uh, make you aware that the presentation slides are already available on um, text project on the David's webinar page. Uh, a recording of the presentation at the very latest will be available on February 5th. We think it'll be earlier. We hope to see you on the next webinar on um, February 27th with Tim Shanahan talking about policy. And remember that the registration will begin two weeks before that, so on February 13th. Uh, we want to thank you, David, for your very thoughtful and clear presentation today. And thank you also to all of you who so generously participated as audience members. And do let us know if you have questions or inquiries, and please direct them to us here at info at textproject.org. Thank you all, and thank you, David.